hymn books to hymn 262, 262. Um, which is our opening prayer and meditation on meditation. Uh, the tune goes something like this. Precious word from God in heaven, full of blessedness to me. Do you familiar with it? We'll see how we go. Okay, let's sing it. Pre precious word from God in heaven, full of blessedness to me. All my trust in thee is given, my salvation rests on thee. I in thee find all I need, that my soul to help can lead. Gracious Spirit, Thou who showest in the word the Father's heart, and all needful help bestowest, light and sense to me impart. That I may the riches see Which God's word here offers me In its grim contemplation From vain cares let me be free And in prayerful adoration Stay thou, O my thoughts on thee. Let no other voice be word while I hearken to thy word. What I did help that I heeded. What thou sayest, let me do. Strength to faith grant that I need it, and remind me still anew that the faith that counts above is erective here in love. Let thy grace sustain, protect me, that thy ways ne'er from thee part, thy enlightening word direct me, seal this treasure in my heart, that in faith I steadfast prove, till I walk by sight above. Notice the writer of that, Benjamin Schmolk, one of the great Lutheran teachers on spirituality, piety. Um, all too little known. Can I beg with you, sisters, brothers, please be here on time? It's getting later and later, almost every day. I don't want to... Uh, hold a threat over you, say, give you no break in the middle or to go over into lunchtime. Uh, please uh, be courteous to people, your fellow students, here on time. Because you, it, uh, it's basically, if somebody's here on time, you're late, you are disrespectful to them. That's my little scold for the day. Now, I want to, uh, this first period, uh, complete the word on meditation. And I want to focus on Luther's teaching on meditation. First, a little bit of confession. <coughs> when I was appointed here at the seminary, it was Luther Seminary back in those days, I was asked um, to take an elective uh, by Dr. Janetsky, who was then Dean of Studies, and um, I came up with a number of proposals as what the elective should be, and I eventually 
uh, sat down with him and said, look, what I would have liked to have had if I, when I was at seminary is a, a course on spirituality. I don't know whether I called it that, but devotional life, prayer, meditation, all that kind of stuff. And he said, yeah, okay, give it a go. We'll see how it goes. And what started off as a once-off elective now has become part of the curriculum. But at that time, um, and then as a result of it, I began to read widely on spirituality, and particularly on meditation. And I read a great deal of stuff that Catholics had written and Anglicans had written, and basically I assumed, and I don't know why, that there was nothing in our Lutheran heritage on meditation. And then I found to my surprise, after I searched around, that by far the best teaching on meditation comes from Luther himself. And this is not only recognised by, well, I don't think it's recognised by Lutherans, but many non-Lutherans recognise this clearly, including some very prominent Catholic teachers, and the man who is now the Archbishop of Canterbury, Rowan Williams, who wrote a wonderful little history of spirituality in the Western Church called The Wound of Knowledge. And he uh, concludes it at the time of the Reformation, basically saying that the two great teachers of spirituality, St John of the Cross, a Catholic guy, and guess who? Martin Luther. Now, what is Luther's teaching on meditation? Now, it's not just because it's Lutheran that I want to touch on it, but because I think it is so practical and helpful and robust and down to earth. Um, we've touched on some of it uh, already, but I want to focus on a number of key texts. Now, um, uh, as you know, Luther entered the monastery, and part of the mon monastic formation was um, training in meditation and prayer, spirituality. That's the big heavy thing. And um, he was introduced um, to what is the classical problem of our spiritual life. Um, now, basically, um, uh, the principle or the reality behind meditation and teaching on meditation is that like knows like. Now, this is an ancient principle, and it's so obvious. Um, so, for example, um, unless I have imagination, I cannot appreciate, say, a picture, artwork. I can't appreciate people who think imaginatively. I've got to be imaginative and have an Im imagination if I am going to receive what is given in terms of imagery. Or, more uh, easier than that, uh, let's say you're a rationalistic person and basically uh, uh, emotionally uh, lack emotional intelligence. Uh, people can express emotions to you, but what's the problem? People try and communicate emotionally to you, share emotions with you, but what will you do? You will translate what they say from emotional terms into rational terms. Um, you've got to have um, uh, emotional sensibility in order to receive emotions and to communicate emotionally. Right? Like knows like. Now, Paul touches this on, first, on this in 1 Corinthians. He says, um, uh, just as you need to be only a human being can understand human language and what's communicated in human language, and you've got to have a human mind and a human spirit if you're going to understand human words. So, um, when it comes to God, unless you have the mind of God, Unless you are attuned to God, you will not receive the things that God wants to give to you in his word. Like knows like. Now, um, uh, that's the basic reality. And coming out of that was the recognition in the whole uh, tradition of Christian piety that in order, the aim was to experience Jesus. Experience Jesus. Um, in order to do that, you needed to become like Jesus to know and experience him and to experience God the Father. Like knows like. Um, 
And uh, the teaching on spirituality basically had to do with the importance of shaping, forming yourself so that you attuned yourself um, uh, mentally, emotionally, imaginatively, spiritually to Jesus. The mind of Jesus, the heart of Jesus, the soul of Jesus, whatever you like to put it. And this happened through uh, the teaching of this, that this happened through meditation and prayer. Now coming out of this, um, they developed a classical pattern on meditation, which you will still find being taught in most of the books on meditation that you find in the library or in any Christian bookshop. You have a four-step pattern. Um, you begin with the reading of the scriptures. Divine reading. Okay, you focus on the scriptures. You read it. If possible, you read it out aloud to yourself. Um, and uh, then you ponder, meditate on the scriptures and the way they address you and you examine yourself in the light of the scriptures. What are they saying to you? What's God's word saying to you about yourself? Um, uh, what's it showing about what you need? And that then leads to prayer for God's grace. Now, those are the three basic steps. So, uh, you start off with reading, prayer, and then... No, reading, meditation, and prayer. Um, the reading is a springboard for meditation. And the goal of that is what uh, is called contemplation. Um, I don't know if you know the term contemplation, which means literally seeing. You know, the aha kind of stuff. A contemplation... Um, uh, which is the experience of union with Christ. So out of that comes the experience of union with Christ. Now, in the Middle Ages, there were uh, uh, five different uh, very uh, powerful traditions, the late Middle Ages, the traditions on meditation. The one focused on the mind, okay, in, uh, uh, so it had to do with the intellect, the intellect, the mind, that you, in order to uh, understand the things of God, your mind had to be in tune with the mind of God. And when your mind was in tune with God's mind, then you would receive enlightenment. You would see with your mind. You'd have insight. Um, uh, the great exponent of that tradition of meditation is St. Thomas Aquinas that uh, uh, intellectual side. Then there is the visionary school, which said that uh, basically focused not on the rational mind thinking, but on imagination, seeing, um, and saying that if your imagination was in tune with God's imagination, if I can put it that way, then you would have a vision of God. You would see with your um, heart or whatever you like to call it. Um, uh, the great teacher of that, or the great exponent of that, if you know anything in the Middle Ages, is uh, the uh, great Italian poem called Dante. He has, has a cycle of poem, poetry called um, uh, you know, the, uh, three, the Divine Comedy. Um, the um, third school, which was by far the most popular school, of meditation had to do with what I'd call emotional meditation. Uh, your heart, your emotions being attuned with the heart of God, with the heart of Jesus. Um, so that you would experience the love of God. Can you see that? So uh, you would have uh, emotional sensitivity and experience the love of God. Um, the great exponent of this is Bernard of Clairvaux, and he has a wonderful commentary on the Song of Songs, which basically elaborates that. And by the way, he had an enormous influence on Luther, this one. Um, and it still has its uh, rather debased modern uh, uh, manifestations in that funny Catholic piety of devotion to the Sacred Heart of Jesus. 
and you get these kitschy Catholic pictures of you know the you know picture of Jesus and his heart's exposed and, the, and there's you know there's a lamp or something like that thorns around it okay and it's the suffering heart of Jesus so um, those statues are come out of that kind of meditation are supposed to teach you that kind of meditation do you get the basic principle um, then uh, there is a, another school um, which uh, focuses on desire will and desire it says uh, that uh, uh, no, for you to experience the things of God, you needed to desire the things of God. Huh? Um, and the problem was that what clouded your union with God was wrong desires. So your desires had to be in tune with God's desires. So you had, if you like, emotional, no, I mean, uh, a purification of desires. It's very closely related, and it's hard to distinguish in some time between these two. Um, the last one was very popular in late Middle Ages, from 1400 going right up to Lutheran time, Luther's times, and that was emphasis on what they called the uh, moral union, which is that you are united with Christ physically through your behavior. If you walk with Christ, then your body is in tune with Christ, um, and you do uh, by doing His will, then you experience that. Um, the great exponent of that is Thomas Akempis, The Brethren of the Common Life, um, uh, a book which is called the, the, imitation the Imitation of Christ. No, The Imitation of Christ, you imitate Christ. Uh, way of life. So all of these are forms of imitation. You imitate the way Christ thinks, you imitate the way Christ imagines, you imitate the way Christ feels, you imitate what Christ desires, you imitate what Christ does in order to have uh, experience union with Christ. Now, um, uh, all of these have uh, are very powerful and have a, a certain validity in them and to some extent as far as scholars can gather Luther was exposed to all of them um, most powerfully the last three here um, but he found that the more that he tried to practice these forms of spirituality devotion the worse things became um, so he discovered say for example with this middle one the more he tried to love God, the more he realized he actually hated God. And it was a devastating experience, his part. How can your love of God, who is the God of justice, who demands what's impossible for us to deliver? How can you demand a God who damns the unrighteous? Um, now, the problem, there were two problems for Luther in these. Um, one was that they put the onus on human performance works. They shift from meditation as reception to meditation as performance. Now, you've got to do the right thing and then things will happen. Um, and uh, the result of that is the more you try, the more you experience failure. Like, the harder you try and discipline yourself in praying, the, the more you uh, become aware of your failure as a person of prayer. And so it ends up giving, giving delivering a bad conscience, a guilty conscience. And as I said, um, it uh, then uh, led to Luther actually realizing that he didn't love God, he hated God. Uh, Behind all of these lies the necessity to love God. Uh, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. Now, um, with his, uh, uh, his so-called evangelical experience, or whatever you scholars like to call it, the, the evangelical breakthrough, was not primarily a matter of uh, theological uh, understanding, but it came out of meditation, and as a result of meditation, 
It came out of meditation and left back into meditation. You remember he was meditating day and night on the phrase from the Psalms, which is also the phrase in Romans, the righteousness of God. The righteousness of God. Um, uh, and uh, the more he meditated on it, the more problems were created until something happened. The Holy Spirit, through Romans 1, uh, beginning 14, 15 and 16, um, uh, uh, revealed to him that the righteousness of God is the righteousness that's revealed through the gospel from faith to faith and it is the gospel is the power of God for what? For salvation. And he experienced then, if I can use that term, that uh, righteousness wasn't just something that God demanded of us but it's something that he gave to us as a gift. And that is what turned everything around for him. Instead of his spiritual life and meditation being a matter of performance, you know, you've got to do this, this method of meditation, that method of contemplation. Um, no. Uh, he came to realize that meditation was a matter of gift, receiving from God, reception from God. Um, and that led to three changes which are, are very subtle but very far-reaching. The first one was that uh, uh, he learned to listen. Um, uh, in med meditation was not a matter of thinking, but a matter of listening to Christ and his word. So it's not a matter of um, thinking or doing, but a matter of listening to Christ and his word. Secondly, um, he realized that uh, the way to receive the gifts of God was not through loving God because if you had to wait until you loved God with all your heart and soul and mind what would happen? Wouldn't happen. It would never happen. You couldn't possibly meditate, you couldn't possibly pray. So uh, love was not the organ to receive the gifts of God but faith was. Faith which receives. Faith, the empty hands that receive what God gives to us through Christ and his word. Um, the third change was uh, uh, to realize that the importance of the Holy Spirit in all this. Who is the one who joins us to Christ and conforms us to Christ, transforms us? We don't change ourselves so it's not a matter of me turning over a new leaf and making myself more spiritual. Who does the changing? The Holy Spirit does. And so uh, Christian spirituality from beginning to end was the work of the Holy Spirit. Apart from the Holy Spirit you couldn't pray and you couldn't meditate. And it was a bit of a, a kind of a circle. You meditate on the word to receive the Holy Spirit. In order to receive the Holy Spirit, uh, to meditate, you need to have the Holy Spirit. So spirit and meditation go together just as spirit and prayer go together. Now I can't emphasize for you strongly enough how valuable those two insights are. So meditation as a gift. Um, I'd like to look at Luther's own um, teaching on this. You're probably familiar with this. Yes, yes, of course. Yes. Yes. Is that almost setting up this kind of like and like? That is it. Not on love or desire. Yes. But on faith. On faith. Faith is where the like. Like. like means like. It's Christ's faithfulness which is met with our faith in Christ's faithfulness. Yeah. Right? That's the like-like. Yeah. Right? It's past all the, it even enables all the others. Now. It enables all the others. And you, you can see Luther doesn't deny this. And all of you will fall into one of those categories in, in your practice of meditation. Um, but that will only find its proper place. This here will work properly. Um, with this. 
Now, notice here how you get this threefold pattern. First reading, then meditation, and then prayer. Now, uh, in, I think it's 1536, Luther's publisher, who wanted to make a buck, asked him to write a preface to a collection of, you know, some of the things that Luther had prepared. He was very reluctant. He said, look, all my books are, uh, were read for, you know, written for specific purposes. They should all be burnt. The only thing I want people to read is the scriptures. In any case, he eventually gave in and wrote a very famous preface to his uh, collected works. 1536, I think the date is from memory. Um, I'd like to go through this because uh, uh, this is so helpful. Now, you've got it in your own hand out there, um, so, uh, but I wanted this to be on one page. There's, uh, Luther has a threefold uh, pattern. First of all, you get prayer, then meditation, and then comes a surprise. Then you have temptation, tentatio. I will give the Latin because temptation is not a good translation of this. Um, okay, now what's interesting is that instead of prayer being second, it's first. And he runs together reading and meditating the scriptures. Okay, this is what he says. And he says, okay, if you want to be a good theologian and if you want to study theology, and he's not talking about academic theology, he's talking about practical theology. If you want to do theology, live theology, this is the way of doing it. And he says, this is what he got from Psalm 119. Remember Psalm 119 is the great psalm of meditating on the Torah of God. He says, first of all, First of all, you must realize that the Holy Scriptures are the kind of book that turns the wisdom of all other books into folly because none of them can teach about eternal life except this alone. Teach about eternal life is not a good translation. It's actually teach eternal life. The idea is not teaching about but teaching to give eternal life. Um, so you should immediately despair of your own reason and understanding. With them you will not attain eternal life. Instead, with arrogance like that, you will hurl yourself and others with you from heaven like Lucifer into the abyss of hell. Rather, kneel down in your room and pray to God with true humility and earnestness that through his dear son he would give you his Holy Spirit to enlighten you, teach you, and give you understanding. You can see how David keeps praying in Psalm 119, teach me, Lord, instruct me, lead me, show me, and so on. Even though he knew the text of the Pentateuch well, and many other books, heard and read them daily, he wanted to have the true teacher, Latin is magister, which is the master teacher of the scriptures for himself as well, so that he would not tackle them with his own understanding and become his own teacher. That produces spiritual rabble-rousers who fancy that the scriptures are subject to them and readily grasp with their own understanding without the Holy Spirit and prayer, like the tales of Markov, a romance novel of the Middle Ages, or Aesop's fables. I, let me focus on a number of things here. Um, first of all, prayer. And notice the emphasis on all three persons of the Trinity. You pray to God the Father through the Son for what? The gift of the Holy Spirit. Because uh, uh, the only person who can teach us the scriptures and open the scriptures to us is the person who has inspired the scriptures, which is the Holy Spirit. Without the Holy Spirit, you cannot receive the things that the scriptures give to us. 
Secondly, notice the emphasis here on um, the contrast between us and Lucifer. You see, one of the problems with classical methods of meditation was that you, it was a picture that you had the ladder of devotion in which you climbed up into heaven. He says, if you try and climb up into heaven, what's going to happen? The same thing will happen to you as happened to Satan. You'll end up in hell, the depths of despair. Um, uh, so the starting point of our spiritual life, of meditation, is on our knees. The, the knees, the beggar's dance. And you pray, not only for the content of meditation, but pray for the Holy Spirit to be your guru, your teacher. Um, the one who opens the scriptures to you. Any questions on that? Okay, then the second uh, point. He says, secondly, you must meditate not only with your heart, that's inwardly, sort of focusing inwardly, but he says also externally by always studying and read and rubbing, reading and rereading the spoken word and written text in the Bible with diligent attention and reflection on what the Holy Spirit means in it. Take care that you do not become bored and think that if you have read, heard or spoken it once or twice, that is enough um, for you to understand it fully. You'll never become a theologian like that, but will be like immature fruit that falls down before it's half ripe. Thus you see, how David constantly boasts in Psalm 119 that day and night and always he would not speak, compose, say, sing, hear and read anything except God's word and commandments. For God will not give you his spirit without the external word. So be guided by that since not for nothing did he command that it should be written preached, read, heard, sung, and spoken externally. Now, there's a number of key things here. Um, the second thing is focusing not inwardly on the Scriptures, but outwardly on the Scriptures. To hear them as spoken from outside to you, the external word, and by that, by the external word, Luther doesn't just mean this. He means the word that is preached, the word that's spoken, the word that's enacted in the divine service. And maybe even spoken by a fellow Christian. The word that comes from outside. Um, the word that's enacted in preaching and in the sacraments. In prayer, in song. Notice the uh, whole list of it here. It's written preached, read, heard, sung, and spoken externally. What is the written part? Good one? What is the written part? This. Oh, yeah, you, you not only hear it, but you yourself write it. Now, there's classical methods of meditation which is say that one of the ways in which you internalize it is not just to speak it, but actually to write it out. To write yourself a to write yourself a song. To write yourself, to write out a scripture passage. Um, I don't, um, uh, because you think also with your hand once you've learned to write. Uh, it becomes part of you. Because the word becomes incarnate in you physically. Uh, singing, speaking, hearing, writing. Uh, notice all the different senses there, yes? Just a tiny example of that. My grandmother lost her fiancé in the war. He was a pilot before he married my grandfather. And, yes. and in her grief, um, the found only after she died, she just wrote out romantic poetry. Yes. And she spent, she's got had journals full of it, not her own, but Byron and all, all this other kind of um, yes. emotional poetry, and that would be a method just, she didn't tell anyone about it, yep. and that was how she'd internalise it, to That's, just write it out. Yep. Um, okay. Uh, very, very uh, profound. Um, let me, uh, second, there's a second thing that I'd like to say. Um, uh, 
See, second, we must meditate, uh, not only with your heart, but also externally, by always studying and rubbing. Now, uh, what's behind this is a very ancient tradition that goes all the way to the early church, which compares meditation to... There's two classical pictures. Meditation is like a cow chewing its cud in order to assimilate what it's browsed. You know, from this, you know, first of all, sheep, cows graze and they go into the four, first stomach and then they lie down and they regurgitate and they chew it up small in order to assimilate what they've taken in. Now that's one picture that's used is uh, meditation is chewing your cud. Chewing the cud. The pic however the picture here rubbing is a picture of what was uh, what happens when you take a herb a herb, uh, in order to release the aroma and the medicine, the, the, the qualities of the herb, what do you have to do? Like garlic? Crush you crush it. And by rubbing it, you release the power of the herb, the sweetness of the herb, the medicine of the herb. So, um, uh, uh, if you like, uh, meditation is crushing something that, it, in order to produce something that's sweet and healing uh, to you, in order to assimilate what it has to offer you. But, but it's particularly the idea of medicine. You crush it. Thirdly, um, the uh, uh, emphasis here is that on the connection between the Holy Spirit and the Word of God. The, the Word of God is not only inspired by the Holy Spirit, but it inspires the Holy Spirit into us. Uh, so, if you want to receive the Holy Spirit, how can you be sure you receive the Holy Spirit? It's through the Word. Um, when we say the Scriptures are inspired by the Holy Spirit, what's entailed in that is that they inspire the Holy Spirit into us. Do you understand that? Um, and so uh, uh, we never possess the Spirit, but we keep on receiving the Spirit through the Word. For God, Luther says, will not give you His Spirit without the external Word. Okay. Now, um, instead of a three-step, one, two, three, kind of a ladder up into heaven, Luther sees a kind of a polarity. You have prayer to meditation. Um, you pray for the Spirit in order to meditate. And then what happens then as you meditate? You receive the Holy Spirit and that leads you back into prayer. So it's a kind of a, 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 what I'd call a circuit of meditation. The circuit between prayer and meditation. <clears throat> okay, that goes like this. So instead of ladder, one, two, three, step up, you get this kind of circuit that goes on. I'd expect him to end there. But um, in many ways, Luther's merely restating the classical tradition. There's not much uh, uh, here that you couldn't find in the fathers in the early church and their teaching. Uh, uh, however, the last part is distinctively Luther. Although if I, you'll find uh, beginnings of this in the Desert Fathers in the early church. Now, look what he says is number three. Thirdly, he says, there is temptation. Now, the, he uses the Latin word tentatio, which is testing, examining, trying. The German word for that is anfektung, which is attack. In modern terms, spiritual attack, spiritual warfare. Now, um, this is a surprise because... Uh, uh, there are, if you like, three teachers of meditation. One is the Word of God, the Holy Spirit. The second one is the Word of God. The third teacher is the devil. Let's see how it goes. 
he says, this is the touchstone that teaches not only um, you not only to know and understand up here, uh, but also to experience how right and true, how sweet and lovely, how powerful and comforting God's word is, wisdom above all wisdom. Thus you see how David in Psalm 119 laments so often about all the different enemies, arrogant princes or tyrants, and all the false spirits, that's the Pentecostalists of the um, Reformation, and hordes, that is to suffer just because he meditates. That is because he deals with God's word, as we have said, in many different ways. In many different ways, not just speaking, but writing and hearing and saying, all the whole stuff. Um, for as soon as God's word shoots up and spreads through you, the devil persecutes you or attacks you. He makes you a true doctor, doctor means teacher of theology. Through his temptations, he teaches you to seek and to love God's Word. Now, this is a brilliant insight. Um, and it accords with something that you've experienced, every Christian experiences. Here am I. I meditate on God's Word. Okay? And by meditating on God's Word, the Word does what? It enters and it penetrates into me. It becomes part of me. By focusing on the Word, the Word comes inside me, fills me, spreads me, grows within me. And um, it enters, what does it bring as it enters into me? The Holy Spirit. Now, as soon as the Holy Spirit comes here with the word, then the evil one will attack. Why will he attack? Because he wants to stop the Holy Spirit from penetrating even further or from you learning about Why? Because then it's the opposite to what the devil wants, because then you follow God and not the devil. And then he loses his hold on you. The more that happens, the less hold he has on you. Uh, see, if you think, it doesn't worry him. If you study theology, if you read all the latest books, even if you memorize the Bible backwards, it doesn't worry him. As long as it stays up where? Here, and it doesn't come in the center of your being. Um, uh, now, um, uh, what he wants to do then, he attacks in order to drive both the Holy Spirit and God's Word out of your heart's life. He wants to just stop you meditating. Now, you've all experienced that. And if you haven't, you will. Promise. Um, he wants to drive it out because as long as he can keep the Word and Spirit from here, he has uh, some hold on you. But as if the Word and Spirit remains in you, then he loses his cause. You're, you become a great threat to his cause. Now, um, uh, okay, that goes that far, but then something funny happens. Why is it that God allows this? Well, Luther says, as when the devil attacks us, tries to drive this out of our heart, in the face of the devil, the only recourse that we can have is to seek and love God's Word. And what happens then is that as a result of the attack, the Word is driven and the Spirit's driven ever deeper into our hearts. Luther uses the picture something like a nail in a piece of wood. So, uh, in the face of attack, 
and any of you who have experienced spiritual attack notice that the only recourse that you have in spiritual attack is the Word of God and prayer. And so you turn to the Word of God and prayer and what happens then is the Spirit and the Word is driven ever deeper into our hearts and lives. Um, so, uh, what's the result of meditation? What does meditation produce? Number one, it produces spiritual attack. You get a hard time of it. Um, and it comes in many different forms. Now, and what's the result of that attack? Then, as a result of this, I experience uh, this, right at the beginning. He says, truly there is temptation. This is the touchstone. Now let me explain what a touchstone is. Do any of you know what a touchstone is? It's not commonly used now anymore because we don't need it. Let's say, uh, yeah, until fairly recent times, if I would have taken this ring to a pawnbroker, um, you know, take it off, he'd see, oh, this is, it, it, it says it's six carat gold or whatever it is, I don't even know, it's ages since I've taken it off. Uh, but he would, he would get out his touchstone. Now his touchstone is uh, a particular kind of stone um, that has the quality that if you run gold over it, it leaves a trace. Um, and the, 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 the coloration of the trace it shows you how pure the gold is. So it's the very low level gold the touchstone will show uh, this shading and then it goes through to a very strong shading. So how do you test whether what purports to be gold is pure and how pure it is, how genuine it is? You run it over the touchstone. Now what's the touchstone for our Christian lives? The touchstone for the genuineness of our faith, the quality of our faith, the quality of our spiritual life is what? Spiritual attack. That's the touchstone because it reveals the character. It reveals what, not what we have done, but what God has done in us. We don't produce pure metal. What, who produces the pure metal? Who refines us? It's God and he refines us through temptation. And it's the temptation itself which shows the um, state we're in spiritually. What God has done in us, what God has given us. Like Job, yes. And uh, notice then, lastly, how this touches right across. It's not purely intellectual. It's not intellectual. It's experiential. You'll experience three things. First of all, you'll experience how um, right and true the Word of God is. You won't just uh, know the Word of God but you will actually experience the truth of God's Word. And therefore, it will produce conviction. Right? conviction. Secondly, it will uh, uh, affect your emotional life. And so you will experience how lovely, how sweet, what's the word that's being used there? How sweet and lovely. They are emotional terms, aesthetic terms. You will experience the sweetness of the Word of God. It affects you emotionally. You experience the truth of it emotionally. And the lastly, how uh, powerful and comforting. Comforting is strengthening in the old usage. Uh, you experience invigoration, strengthening in your body. So it affects your mind, your heart, your body. And you experience, what you experience in a sense is not Union with Christ, what do you experience? What is it that you experience in this? That you drift further apart from Christ. Well, that's, that's what seems to be happening quite often. On, so that's the helplessness and your dependence on the Word. But what do you experience then in the face of temptation? You experience the truth of you experience the Word of God. So the Word of God, instead of being theoretical, becomes enacted in you. You experience the Word. So you're the Word of God and your experience 
come together. The word in your experience. And what you experience is not so much union with Christ up in heaven, but if there is union with Christ, it's union with Christ. The word. The word. More. Here and now. Here and now. Even more so. Christ crucified rather than Christ glorified. Um, Christ who is attacked, tempted, as we are. So union with Christ crucified. Hence, Luther spoke a lot about theology of the cross or spirituality of the cross. Um, now, let me just one find, yes, M Michael, did you have a hand up there? Uh, let's see if you can, you can get this then. Um, okay, so this here, temptation is not third stage, but it's the third aspect of meditation. So you pray for the Holy Spirit uh, through, through the Word, you focus on the Word for the gift of the Holy Spirit, and you know that you've received the Spirit by attack. So, um, let's, see if, uh, let's see if you can think in the way Luther thought. Uh, if somebody came to him and asked him the question, how, uh, 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 how do you know that you are filled with the Spirit? Okay, because I know I'm saved, I know I'm filled with the Spirit because the devil gives me a hard time. If I wasn't saved, if I didn't have faith, and real faith, then the devil would leave me alone because he wouldn't want to frighten me back to Christ. So how do I know that I'm saved? How do I know I have the Holy Spirit? Because of the evil spirit attacking me. Secondly, there's one place where... Um, Luther says, calls the devil the comforter of the faithful. Can you work out how? What he means? He brings assurance of salvation. He brings assurance of salvation and he actually strengthens our faith. Can you see that what this attack does is takes the weaker faith and makes it stronger and stronger. This, it, it, it's attack, spiritual attack that grows faith. Um, and lastly, um, he says that uh, who's the best teacher of theology? The devil is the best teacher of theology. Look at what he says in one of his table talk sections. And I commend this to you very, very warmly. He says, I did not learn my theology all at once, but had to search constantly deeper and deeper for it. My trials impelled me to do this since no one can understand Holy Scripture without practice and trial. Now, medieval teachers would agree without practice. Can you see what practice is? The Word tells you to do something. You've got to do this, this, this. So you learn it by doing it. But trial means here attack. So, it, yes, it is doing, it's, it's real experiential stuff, but it is through trial attack. This is what the enthusiasts, that's the spiritualists, and sects lack. They don't have the right opponent, the right antagonist, um, the devil, who is the best teacher of theology. If we don't have that kind of devil, we have nothing but speculative theologians who do nothing but meander around in their own ideas and speculate with their reason alone as to whether things should be like this or like that. Oh, that's sarcastic. And it's true of most of the stuff that you find in our library. Speculative theology which he had nothing but contempt for. The only theology that's worth a cracker is not just theology of the word, which can be very speculative, but theology that comes from experience, the test of trial. Um, in case you haven't realized it, that you have been, there's two, been two parts to the curriculum since you've entered this community. There's the teaching that's been done within the classrooms not by one teacher, but a whole number of teachers, and you all teach each other here. But the most important teacher for you here has been this guy. 
unfaithful attack teaches theology. Apart from that, uh, uh, you have academic, theoretical theology, not practical theology. You don't have spirituality. Now, this takes many different guises, and for each one of you, it's, it's different, and it's going to be different. And this is going to be the story for the rest of your lives. Josh. Um, what, what's he getting at about the enthusiasts lacking, not having the right opponent and lacking this trial? Uh, okay. Uh, uh, they lack this trial, which is the attack of the devil. Um, the enthusiasts, you see, the enthusiasts are people who wanted to have the spirit apart from the word. They have opponents, but who are their opponents? You know, the, the, the church, people like Luther, the, the ones who taught the word of God, um, they had nothing but disdain for and said, you know, these are, um, uh, no, they'd say, all that, all that they were teaching is head stuff. We have the heart stuff. Uh, they have, the external word can't save, the external word's no good. What we have is the internal word, the prophetic word that speaks inside of us. Um, that's the spirit-filled word. Um, so uh, uh, they focus on the wrong thing, they focus on the wrong opponents, and therefore they... It's really sarcastic because he's saying he's basic, they basically do the devil's work for him, which is speculative theology. Okay, any, Michael, did you have your hand up there? No. Any questions on this? Okay, there's a, a, a depth of riches here, which is very important. One final thing um, before we have a break, and then uh, uh, I want to wrap this up. Uh, what you need to know is that behind this teaching lies not just Psalm 119, but the whole book of Psalms. Remember I said, what's the best text handbook, not textbook, what's the handbook on meditation? The Psalms. And the Psalms don't give you the theory of meditation, they actually give you meditation as a gift. They give you meditations. Um, uh, you don't have to do it for yourself, it is done for you and you, it's given to you. Now, um, in the Psalms, the commonest category of Psalms are the laments. And what's the focus in the laments? Spiritual attack, because almost every lament focuses on the enemy and the enemies. And they meditate not on uh, nice things, heavenly realities. The laments meditate on troubles, trials, and particularly the attacks of the enemy. And the fact that the enemy or enemies seem to triumph over somebody who's godly. And the laments arise because God seems not to deliver what he promises. God is just, and what do I experience? Injustice. God is faithful, and he's supposed to be with me. What do I experience? God's absence. He abandoned me. He's far from me. God is loving and kind. He should provide for me in my need. How come I'm poor? How come I don't have the things that I need? Now, um, so those psalms arise from the apparent contradiction between God's word, his promises, and my experience. And the focus in those psalms then is always on the enemy which lies behind my negative experience. Okay? Um, and uh, 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 out of that then comes prayer and a, a, a strengthening in faith and praise. So laments are a part of meditation. And if you want to flesh out this third part here, what's meant by this, have a look at the book of Psalms. That's where you find it in quite concrete detail. Okay. Anything else on this? Since we started late, can we make a break only of five minutes, please?